Good afternoon and welcome to the European Renal Association e seminars. Uh, today we are talking about overweight, obesity and strain obesity links uh, with the renal disease. First, I would like to thank European Renal Association and the obesity group for this opportunity to moderate uh, this, uh, this seminar. By participating in LIF, uh, participant will earn, do you remember, one European credit for their continuous medical education. This is an exclusive benefit for ARA members. As you know, the obesity is related to a large number of uh, systemic pathologics, among which uh, we could mention renal pathology. Over the last decades, experimental and clinical studies have shown that obesity, overweight, and strain obesity is an independent risk factor for the development for proteinuria and chronic kidney disease. However, one of the most important aspects has been the study and development of different etiopathogenic mechanisms between the obesity and kidney relationship. It's very important, the cross relationship between obesity and the kidney. For me, it's a pleasure to be able to introduce my webinar colleagues. Uh, first, Emma Medina Gomez, is Associated Professor, Department of Basic Science of Health, Faculty of Science of Health, Universidad Rey Juan Carlos I in Madrid, Spain. Uh, she's a PI of Lipoeta Group and a high performance research group in the study of the molecular mechanisms of uh, glipolitoxicity and insulin resistance in obesity, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. And no, this is only Gemma, and we have two very important panelists, uh, such as Ma Maru Navarro, a clinical nephrologist uh, in German trial, uh, trials in Pujols, the Hospital ba Badalona, Barcelona. Is the chair of the David City Working Group. Her line of research is renal involvement of morbid obesity. Studies carried out in Hermann Trias Research Institute. And she's currently investigating the bariatric surgery changes in obesity related glomerulopathy and transcriptomic level in experimental model with obesity rats. And finally, no, finally, but is my colleague and my friend Francesco Trevisani, is nephrologist in the Department of Urology, San Rafael Scientific Institute in Milan, his PhD in molecular medicine and the head of nephrology research activity in the Urological Research Institute, San Rafael. Founder and CEO of BioRec, Biotech company related to molecular diagnostic field in oncology since 2019. National license to assistant professor in nephrology in 2021. Before to, to begin to, to this talk, uh, I uh, like you to, to record, to, don't forget the audience to the participate with the comments and the question because it's very important uh, for this seminar, uh, the participation of uh, the audience. But first, uh, Gemma, when do you want? This is uh, for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let's... Sorry, I'm gonna just open uh, my presentation. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the, the obesity group, especially to uh, Dr. Morales and Dr. Porrini for this kind invitation to give uh, some clues and, and, and especially to speak about what we are doing here in the University of Rey, uh, Juan Carlos. So here, are, sorry. Um, this is my um, uh, slide with a conflict of uh, interest. I don't have to, to mention anything. And this is like the outline that uh, 
just to to show you uh, what about what uh, about I'm going to to speak in the next uh, 30 more or less 30 minutes. I'm going to speak about the adipose tissue expandability uh, hypothesis. What is telling us this uh, hypothesis? And then I will I will go to this paradigm for understanding the consequence of overlaying adipose tissue between lipodystrophy and obesity. After I will introduce some mechanisms underlying the association between obesity and kidney chronic disease. And then I will finish with some work that, uh, that we are doing in, in our department in specific um, uh, animal models for, for obesity related kidney research. And then what uh, the, some of the studies that we are doing about lipotoxicity in, in humans. It's well known that the development of obesity requ requires a positive energy balance. This positive energy balance occurs when uh, energy intake is greater than energy expenditure. And then uh, leading to uh, resulting in weight uh, gain and fat deposition. In a state of uh, obesity, there is, uh, what is have seen is that there is increased demands of adipose tissue expandability. What is the sorry? What is the uh, this uh, hypothesis tell us? What is the adipose tissue expandability? Uh, this is hypothesis tell us that the adipose tissue expansion is not infinite; it has a limit. So the capacity to expand uh, fat mass to store lipids is a more important determinant of obesity-associated metabolic complications than the absolute amount of adipose tissue that any individual possess. So there's a point of maximal expansion that determines the fat leakage or lipid spillover to the rest of the uh, tissues, including uh, kidney, to develop or leading to uh, metabolic complexities. This is a process called as um, lipotoxicity. Lipotoxicity occurs when under uh, overnutrition stage, the deep sites start to increase, expand, uh, and then stop because there is a limit of in the expansion. Under these conditions, there is a leakage of uh, free fatty acids, triglycerides, but not only lipids, also inflammatory cytokines that goes to different tissues, muscle, liver, pancreas, developing all these problems or metabolic problems like insulin resistance, uh, cell start to fail or developing type 2 diabetes, and also about um, having these renal complications directly for the effects of these uh, cytokines or lipids or directly from uh, the development of the um, diabetes. Sorry, oops. So here we have the fair question. It means that to have less fat is always is is um, is always better than to have more fat. Uh, here you have in the slide you can see a lip, a partial lip lipodystrophy patient where they have normal normal uh, body max index, but they are diabetic, insulin resistant, hypertensive, e and uh, dyslipidemic. We have another, another example with liposuction or lip, lipectomies. But they are specific surgeries that they extract seven, uh, big amounts of adipose tissue, but without any or minimal metabolic impact or improvement of, for instance, insulin sensitivity. As you can see, there is this uh, paradigm between uh, lipodystrophy and obesity. In both situations, opposite situations, we have a saturation of adipose tissue, a dysfunction in the adipose tissue. One, because there is a limit in the expansion. The other um, state, lipodystrophy, is because there is no uh, fat. So there is a lipid overflow in both situations and fat deposition in different tissues. So developing um, a metabolic um, uh, problems such as insulin resistance or another metabolic complication. We have seen that adipose tissue is associated with a, a leptin deficiency under this situation of lipodystrophies. Also, 
We have seen that patients with lipodystrophy, uh, with lipodystrophy uh, accumulates fat in the uh, fat in the liver, developing this uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And also, uh, these um, specific patients um, present or show severe insulin resistant and metabolic control. So, is that related, related with kidney, kidney disease? Yes, it has uh, seen that uh, there is, a, in these patients, classic histophalogic uh, features of diabetic nephropathy. And also, it has been seen that some of the um, specimens specific for these patients show uh, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. So, both situations are related with a specific adipose uh, tissue dysfunction and accumulation of uh, lipids in, uh, in specific uh, organs. So here we have the second question. Is more fat is, uh, is always uh, bad? In the slide, you can see two uh, ladies with different uh, accumulation of fat. One is accumulation, uh, is accumulate um, uh, fat around the gluteus or mass in the down a part of the body. The other lady accumulates more fat in the abdominal part of the of the of the body. This represents both types of um, obese patients: the metabolic healthy obese patients and the metabolic abnormal patients. So um, these patients respond differently to the metabolic complications. As you can see in this slide, uh, the responsive uh, to weight loss is different in the metabolic uh, healthy um, of these patients that they don't show any, any um, more uh, problems uh, than the um, metabolic abnormal of these patients. And even the response is different to the, to the weight loss. Also, the prevalent by age is different in, in both types on, of, uh, of patients where there's more in, uh, it's increase in the metabolic health of this prevalence uh, than uh, in, in, other, in other ages. And then also the presence of uh, diabetes or other uh, cardiovascular disease, so that you can see that the incidence is, uh, is, is uh, increased in the metabolic abnormal obese compared to this uh, metabolic healthy uh, obese. So what is happening with this specific obese patients, the two both types of obese patients in related with chronic kidney disease? Some publications have shown that there is a no association between the metabolic healthy obese patient with incident of CKD. As you can see here, Mm, the percentage is presented between metabolic health non-obese patients, metabolic health obese patients, metabolic abnormal uh, no obese patients, and metabolic abnormal obese patients. So the incidence of chronic kidney disease is supposed to be increased in the uh, metabolic abnormal obese. Similar pattern um, is uh, presented in the incidence of proteinuria. Uh, with more incident in the metabolic abnormal obese. So under uh, this, uh, is, this events, uh, it's is important to ask, is, a, is definitely a relation between obesity and chronic kidney disease? We can say that yes, definitely, uh, despite all these events, uh, there are more evidence that uh, there is association between uh, obesity and uh, chronic kidney disease. Although obesity is a, a major cause of uh, diabetes and hypertension, two of the primary events or causes of chronic kidney disease, recent, recent epi epidemiolo uh, epidemiological um, epidemiologic studies indicates that obesity is an independent risk factor of chronic kidney disease. And in this slide, you can, uh, you can see 
specific, uh, specifically potential mechanisms underlying the association between obesity and chronic kidney disease. Basically, what I mentioned before, there is a problem in the adipose tissue. The adipose tissue under caloric stress, they start to uh, expand, expand with the increased adipocytes in number and especially in size. The adipocytes uh, present hypertrophy. This leads to insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, macrophage accumulation, inflammation, and adipokine dysfunction. This is going to affect directly to the, um, uh, to the kidney because there is an increase in leptin, uh, uh, decrease in adiponectin, and other metabolites uh, that is going to affect directly to the, to the kidney. Uh, this um, alteration in this adipokine secretion pattern is going to affect or going to uh, produce oxidative stress in the kidney, inflammation, and fibrosis, leading to the appearance of uh, albuminuria and, glory, and glomerulopathy. So definitely the dysfunction of adipose tissue is going to start because there is an alteration in the secretion pattern of the adipokines. Uh, adipokines that uh, usually are used to see the more common leptin adiponectin, but there are a lot of um, uh, adipokines that could affect directly in the uh, kidney, such, such as aplin, resistin, uh, RBB4, there are uh, uh, several uh, of them. But not only adipokines, the, 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 the alteration in the pattern of secretion of adipokines is going to be altered. Also, there is angio, uh, factors uh, angiogenesis uh, that is related to angiogenesis, like BGF, uh, C, uh, BGFs, also inflammation um, factors, cytokines, that they are going to affect directly to the uh, different cells in the, uh, in the kidney. Uh, podocytes, mesangial cells, tubular uh, um, cells. Uh, these are going to have an effect, direct effect in, in the glomerulus uh, apart, uh, or together with the effect of uh, the FD lipids. Also, there are another mechanisms uh, in terms of uh, injury in the vascularity uh, with hemodynamic alterations. Dilation, the dilatation of afferent arterial, um, a reduction in the in the um, uh, in the uh, efferent arterial is going to produce an increase in the pressure in the tension, and this is going to develop um, glomerulomegaly and a maladaptive podocyte stress. Uh, leading to the development of uh, obesity-related glomerulopathy. Glo After this uh, uh, introduction, I'm gonna uh, show you what we are doing in the in the lab. Our research program is focused specifically to understand how is the link between all this uh, insulin resistance and cardiometabolic complication. Our hypothesis is that the failure, specific failure of adipose tissue expandensibility can result in lipotoxicity in the different tissues. So we are uh, working specifically in adipose tissue to see or how uh, is the function of uh, the adipose tissue and, and, uh, and its expandability. We work also in brain adipose tissue now uh, we are more and more interested in the lipotoxicity, specifically in uh, fat, uh, in, the, in the kidney. I mean, uh, now what is known as fat kidney. So we are working in animal models, specifically under diet manipulations or even genetically modified models. And now we are working in a specific, in a, a, in a molecule, is uh, related with fibrosis in uh, TF beta 3. We have seen that TF beta 3 is decreased in, in podocytes treated with palmitic acid, decrease in obese uh, models, and also during aging. Here you have uh, mice with four months, 15 months, where this specifically factor uh, TF beta 3 
is decreased compared to, to the one month uh, mice, longer mice. So we are working specifically in mice with a deletion, partial deletion of this factor uh, related with fibrosis, TGF beta 3. Uh, we have two different ages with uh, both uh, types of uh, diet, control diet and high fat uh, diet. What we have seen in, oops, sorry. What we have seen in this, um, in this uh, model is that even under a normal uh, diet, control diet, we have an increase in the ACR, in the ratio albumin creatinine, even at uh, uh, one month of age, four months and 15 months in the, in the uh, etrocygos TGF beta 3 compared to the, to the wild type was a decrease in the orient uh, volume in at the age of four months in the in the trisagos TGF beta 3 with a, a decrease in the GFR in the ratio uh, of um, a glomerular filtration uh, measured by ioxol uh, in the mice uh, heterozygous mice of TGF beta 3 in, in at the existing months with no difference in blood pressure we follow uh, our sorry <laughs> Oops. Uh, okay so we follow with the study of these mice with a partial deletion of tgf beta 3 and we saw that um, specifically uh, this down regulation leads to renal fibrosis you can see here the control diet wild type and the trozygos tgf beta 3 uh, that this represents uh, some uh, alpha SMA staining, but you can see that there is, there is an increase compared to the wild type, uh, at, even at control diet, more pronounced, it's at the high fat diet. Uh, diet. This is um, associated with higher glomerulosclerosis levels in, in mice, heterozygous mice, uh, which was very increased in the high fat diet um, uh, situation. So this TF beta 3 down regulation is linked to lipid accumulation. Uh, we have seen even in the control diet that there is some accumulation. Here is the uh, lipid uh, um, accumulation by red oil, red oil uh, technology and also by uh, the body by intensity by uh, measure by cytometry, uh, flux cytometry. But you can see even at, at control diet, there is an increase in the accumulation of lipids in, in the kidney. This accumulation was associated with the fat lipid oxidation. And as you can see here, some genes such as PIPAR alpha, CC1 alpha, CC1 beta, all related with lipid oxidation, was decreased in the cycle of mice even at a control diet or even at high fat diet. So after having these results, we were interested to see uh, what could be the main um, mechanisms involved in this lipid accumulation, specifically by, by down regulation of the TGF beta 3. So what, what we decide, and another member of my, of my lab, uh, Borja Lanzón, is working in, um, in the technology of uh, med, uh, lipidomics. Lipidomics um, uh, using uh, this uh, mass, like max spectrophetry, uh, that um, could ask some clues about uh, new biomarkers to see if uh, we could relate uh, the association of obesity. And in this case of the, in the case of the of the mice that we were studying between diet, high fat diet, and the development of uh, fibrosis in the in the kidney. Oops, I sorry, I don't know what I have done. Oops, sorry. Um, ah, yeah, now. So um, here, uh, what uh, what we have studied the profile, the uh, specific uh, profile in metabolites and lipids. In this first panel, you can see 
that there is an increase in specific metabolites, uh, like such as formic acid, malic acid, or uh, oxalic acid, that could be related with the damage in the kidneys of these mice. Also, we have seen the pattern or the, the lipid profile on this in this specific mice, and we have seen increase in a specific lipid species such as triglycerides or sphingomyelines, lysophosphatidylcholines, they are increased in this, uh, in this mice. So making a, a specific enrichment overview of these metabolites and lipids, what we, can, we, could, um, uh, we could see is that the mitochondrial electron transport chain um, um, pathway was altered in this in this uh, in mice, and in fact, when we sorry, oh, sorry, when we study the um, expression of some markers of mitochondria, we will see that the, the expression of opal one, mitofusin one, and, and, and specifically, were decreased in the kidneys of these heterozygous uh, beta uh, mice. Also, when we check the uh, electron microscopy of the mitochondria, we could see that, that there was alteration in the mitochondria of this uh, animal, and also with specific um, uh, forms of the mitochondria, uh, patho pathological forms, like this oleon-like structure. So what is happening with uh, lipotoxicity in humans? We are following this study in, in collaboration with Dr. Enrique Morales and Esteban Porrini with uh, 12 morbid obese patients uh, without and with a chronic kidney disease. Both groups were uh, uh, underwent bariatric surgery and uh, we follow by uh, 12 uh, months. So with the intention and the primary outcome after this bariatric surgery, to have a reduction of pitinuria and albuminuria. So what, uh, what we want uh, also to study is just the patients that were not uh, presenting chronic uh, kidney disease to follow uh, in a similar way with uh, the other patients to have both, uh, both um, lines, progr progressions of, of uh, both uh, patients. So this is still ongoing, but hopefully I can show you uh, here some, some uh, more or more results. In this slide, you can see the metabolic and renal function parameters. And as you can see, that the obese with uh, chronic uh, kidney disease present altered Uh, parameters, uh, renal function parameters compared to the obese uh, control, creatinine, tinuria, and, uh, and some DFR estimated. Uh, after the uh, bariatric surgery, what we have is uh, an improvement in these metabolic um, uh, parameters with uh, changes in body weight, BMI, fat mass, glucose, and uh, uh, specifically Glycerides. Uh, after bariatric surgery, what we didn't have is uh, um, an improvement in all the parameters. But as you can see, we had in the in the in the uh, ACR and proteinuria in the patients with uh, with uh, with uh, chronic kidney disease after this bariatric surgery. So what? Uh, what the first uh, study that, that we performed was to, uh, to see what is happening with the adipose tissue. As you can see here, we have continuous adipose tissue, a uh, visceral adipose tissue on, from both types of, uh, of, of, of uh, patients, obese controls and obese patients with CKD. We couldn't find any difference between both types of um, adipocytes in the area or in the frequency. Here you can see the frequency of, uh, of the number of adipocytes with different size. We didn't, we couldn't find any difference. What we don't know exactly is, uh, and we are very interested to see if other depots, uh, for instance, um, the renal um, adipose tissue or the, the sinus, uh, the fat in the sinus of the, 
of the uh, kidneys could be affected. But at the moment, we are not able to study this, this fat. We will study in the animal models. So uh, basically, what we what you have here is that metabolic parameters increase in obese uh, with a CKID, CPTI, the insulin, glucagon, you can see there are difference between these uh, uh, metabolic parameters. So now what we are trying to do now is to see there are difference between this patient uh, um, uh, with the disassociation of the present of diabetes. As you can see, CPTI, there are difference in the, in the patient with, uh, with chronic kidney disease, but without the present of diabetes. The same or the similar, uh, similar pattern occur with insulin. So suggesting that insulin resistance could be a determinant um, factor to be in account where, when the obesity is present in, the, in, this, in, in chronic kidney disease uh, patients. Also, we have uh, we have seen different adipokines like leptin, bisfatin, resistin, adipis, adipsin, and in terms of this, um, uh, in, in terms of this um, adipokines, we didn't find any uh, difference between. Sorry, oops. We didn't see any difference between. Uh, in between the uh, patients with, with diabetic or without uh, diabetes. For instance, adipsin, uh, it was increasing in the patients with CKD uh, in diabetic patient, patients and no diabetic uh, patients. Only this fatin was not uh, changed in diabetic patients, but it was uh, increased in the chronic kidney uh, um, patients they were not diabetic compared with the uh, patients of this patient that they didn't have any problem in the kidney. Uh, also, we have uh, studied different um, uh, uh, inflammatory cytokines, and in terms of this, in the looking one beta, TNF alpha, in the looking since we didn't see any difference, sorry, any difference between non diabetic and diabetic patients meaning that all these chronic uh, disease patients, uh, they are going to have increase in all these uh, inflammatory cytokines. Only we have difference in uh, this interleukin 1 array and MIP 1A, MIP 1B, meaning that uh, although they didn't present any difference in diabetic patients, we have increase in the non-diabetic patients uh, the ones that uh, presented chronic kidney uh, disease. This is in interleukin receptor antagonists and in macrophage inflammatory proteins, specifically uh, the isoform 1A. Uh, what is happening with angio um, angiogenic factors like BFB, uh, BFGF, and BFB? We had increase in the obese uh, patients with chronic kidney disease, and when we Sorry, when we uh, separate the, the patients between diabetic and non-diabetic, we have a difference between these patients that they were uh, presented chronic kidney disease without any diabetes in terms of um, com or in, compa in, in comparing to the non uh, with the diabetic uh, patients. So meaning that this angiogenic factor could be also related specifically with obesity and not directly uh, with uh, the, the diabetes. This is happening also with the uh, fibrotic factors, with increase in the non-diabetic um, uh, patients that they presented chronic kidney disease without any difference in the diabetic uh, patients. So what is, what was uh, what was happening in the after the bariatric surgery? All these inflammatory, uh, angiogenic, and profibrotic factors were decreased after the um, the surgery. We don't have results separating this between non-diabetic and diabetic, but hopefully we will have some results in in 
in, a, in, the, in the future. So what is happening about the lipid profiles in this uh, specific patient? As you can see, there was a good separation between obese control, post-bariatric and pre-bariatric uh, obese uh, patients. And as you can see here, this is the lipid profile in serum that uh, there are an increase, for instance, in, in the right uh, panel, you can see an uh, increase in triglycerides, phosphatidylcholines, uh, even in ceramides, uh, in the uh, patients, obese patients with chronic kidney disease compared with the obese controls. After surgery, all these uh, specific lipids, they decrease to similar levels to the ones that the obese, obese control presented after, uh, after these patients after the, the, the surgery. What is more interesting uh, for us was this specific, like so phosphatidylcholine and this phosphatidyl, uh, phosphatidylcholine. These uh, specific lipids were increased in the uh, uh, patients, obese patients, that presented chronic kidney disease, but as you can see in the right panels, they didn't uh, decrease after the, the bariatric surgery. Uh, we could say, is that um, specific biomarkers of um, renal, uh, renal damage, specifically during obesity, or this could be biomarkers that they don't decrease even to have an improvement of body weight and all these um, parameters, metabolic and renal function parameters. So we are trying to, to find out uh, whether this specific lipids could be uh, suggested or suggesting to have any biomarkers at, uh, at the future. So just to finish in, I will give you some take home messages. Uh, renal accumulation of a specific lipids and the uh, toxic effects during obesity lead to renal uh, dysfunction. We think that specifically podocytes are highly susceptible to lipotoxicity, uh, lipotoxicity during obesity. I well, I can, I, I have I have um, show the importance or try to show the importance of TJ beta three in kidney in the pathogenesis of lipotoxic nephropathy and obesity. And what we are trying to, to, to study or to develop uh, is um, a technological advances in mass spectrometry based lipidomics and metabolic data platforms uh, to have the opportunity uh, to study specific profiling in, of lipids and metabolites to take this to the, uh, to the clinic at the advance of a translational research in obesity-related CKD. Just to finish, to, to thank my, my, the persons of, uh, of uh, who are doing uh, very hard work in the, in the lab and all the funding, and especially, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, the obesity group to give me the opportunity to show the work that we are doing in, in the lab. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Emma, for your nice presentation. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to, to work together in the basic and clinical uh, studies. Um, and I'm sorry, but I forgot my introduce myself. I'm nephrologist, I'm Enrique Morales, I'm nephrologist at the Hospital uh, 12 de Octubre de Madrid, Spain, and I associated uh, a professor of uh, medicine and a member of uh, the obesity working group. Uh, thank you, Gemma, for your presentation. Uh, the audience, don't forget, don't forget to participate with the comments and the questions. It's very important uh, because it's a stimulus for, uh, for this seminar. And now it's a pleasure to present two panelists. First, uh, Maru Navarro, and, uh, and the second one, uh, Francesco Trevisani. Uh, what do you want? Um, thank you, Enrique. Thank you, Gemma, for your wonderful presentation, as usual. First, I would like to uh, make some comments, and at the end, I will address uh, a couple of questions to Gemma. 
as Enrique said at the, at the beginning of this e-seminar, um, much has been um, described and investigated on uh, obesity and its comorbidities uh, since the World Health Organization announced that obesity was the um, pandemic of the 21st century. We currently know that obesity is a cause of um, potentially reversible kidney disease. So it has been described as uh, Gemma said, as a, a secondary form of glomerular focal and segmental glomerular sclerosis being glomerulomegaly, the uh, most remarkable uh, feature. Further, um, it has been demonstrated that uh, in its early stages, this disease is asymptomatic. So um, at this point, I think it's very important to find novel solutions for the development of reliable, uh, non-invasive uh, diagnostic uh, tools to detect early stages of obesity uh, related glomerulopathy and monitor the progression. I would like to emphasize the importance of preclinical studies uh, since they allow us to investigate the uh, biological processes um, that are involved in uh, obesity related glomerulopathy. As having uh, renal tissue from obese patients uh, is, uh, becomes uh, complicated sometimes especially if they don't have overt uh, clinical renal manifestations. HEMA uh, has shown us novel molecular uh, insights into obesity-related uh, glomerulopathy that will help us to better understand the mechanisms of kidney disease in obesity, and maybe it's linked with obesity-related uh, hepatic disease. As some authors uh, suggest, um, ectopic lipid deposition in the hepatocyte results in endoplasmic reticulum stress, which plays an important role in the development of uh, fatty acid, um, uh, sorry, a non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease. So my first question, uh, finally, is uh, what is your opinion about uh, this mechanism of injury in the kidney? And do you think that uh, this could be a link between chronic kidney disease and not non-alcoholic fatty uh, liver disease in obesity? And the second question is um, in light of your results and uh, from the point of view of the translation to um, clinical practice, would it be feasible to determine um, the lipid profile that you describe as biomarker of chronic kidney disease in obese patients? Uh, what would be um, your recommendation on this regard? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for these, uh, these questions. About the, the first one, uh, for sure the, the, there must be a, a connection between the fatty liver and the kidney in the and the fatty kidney because uh, it means that uh, as i presented uh, all uh, these complications uh, the uh, derive from uh, adipose tissue malfunction in in this that situation there is a leakage of lipids that they go to different different tissues but also there is no only lipids there are inflammation that they are uh, a leakage as well of, of um, pro-inflammatory uh, pro cytokines that could, uh, could affect these both tissues. What is known, or, or it's more studied, is the connection between the fatty liver and the effect on the kidney. There are several, um, there are several uh, molecules like fentuin A or FGF21 that they have been shown that the has can uh, can affect. They are secret secreted by the hepatocytes, and they have some effect um, uh, in the in the kidney, in the specifically in 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 the renal renal cells. What is not very uh, studied, very known, is the uh, the the opposite effect. So, is fatty kidney secreting some molecules that could affect? The, the liver, that is not shown. But for sure, uh, there is a connection. And also because there is a, a general uh, um, lower, lower uh, uh, inflammation state that could affect different tissues, not only kidney 
and and and, and liver in this in this case. But for sure, they they say a connection between both intercross uh, talking uh, each other. And I'm I'm not sure if I, I answer your your question. Yes, of course. And then about uh, about the second, um, as I said, is um, more important um, more important to to see uh, what is what is the diagnosis of uh, of uh, renal disease in in obese patients. So basically, uh, it will be important to 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 just to uh, to have the possibility to study like a lipid profile in not only serum, we are trying to, 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 to do the, the lipidomic profile in urine to see whether there is a biomarker or any uh, difference between the, the, the lipids uh, from a patient who is gonna develop chronic kidney disease and uh, uh, with comparing with the obese People that they are not going to develop any chronic kidney disease. So I mean, I mean, uh, I, I think that the the major problem is that this limit in their tissue. Uh, the the, the um, patients who develop chronic kidney disease could have a short limit in the, the expansion of their adipose tissue. The other patients that they don't develop uh, kidney uh, kidney uh, kidney chronic, chronic kidney disease they could not have this specific limit in their expansion, so they can just manage to, to, to have this uh, function in their adipose tissue, so then there's not a leakage uh, of lipids uh, to, the, to the kidney. So that is the, so it would be, mm, I think that fantastic if, if we could take these uh, this technical uh, approximations and uh, approaches to the, to the clinician, uh, to the clinic. Okay, I would like uh, to, to, to do any comment uh, in relation to with the first question of Maru and the crosstalk uh, between uh, fatty liver disease and the chronic kidney disease. Uh, we uh, recently, we, we have published uh, an NDT um, in patients with diabetic kidney disease, uh, the fibrosis of fatty liver disease uh, was a cross, uh, cross tucker relationship uh, between the progression of chronic kidney disease uh, in patients with the baseline with the same glomerular filtration rate and the same proteinuria. The most important factor was the fibrosis of liver disease. I think it is other factor that the clinicians uh, have to study in our patients because it's very, very important to know what is the situation uh, in the progression of the chronic kidney disease. Actually, yes, in the in the study that I, I show you today, uh, when when there is like a separation between diabetic patients and non-diabetic patients, actually the these profibrotic uh, factors were increased in the in the non-diabetic uh, uh, CKD patients and with no difference in the diabetic frame. So that is means that this could, uh, this will be a, a good factor to measure in the, in the, in the clinic uh, to see uh, if they could have an, a, a, a complication in, in these uh, factors. Okay, thank you, Gemma. Francesco? Okay, well, thanks to everybody. <clears throat> Cam, I think that your presentation is uh, brilliant because it clearly highlights uh, all the type of dysfunction, the renal dysfunction, but also the liver dysfunction that can happen when we have an obese patient. And so the first comment uh, that I should say is that, uh, as also Maru underlined, uh, we are speaking about a reversible problem. So we are speaking about something that we should and we could prevent uh, with a good lifestyle, with a correct diet, because if bariatric surgery is fundamental to reduce all the chronic kidney disease processes, such as proteinuria and other uh, renal damage, we can see that is always a surgery with uh, some risk related to the procedure. So uh, the first comment is that uh, it's quite important to 
highlights that the incidence of obesity is high also in the younger guys, in teenager, and is a very problem. It's a problem because a lot of these guys don't know the real damage and also the real kidney damage, which can experience over time. And so my first comment as a clinician and also researcher is that we should do something more to uh, give some information also in the school system and also to avoid this process because we know that a young obese child will become an obese patient with a lot of problems in the future. And so the first question is, uh, do you think that the metabolic healthy obesity and the metabolic unhealthy obesity are two different, completely different diseases or there is some a gray zone and maybe the metabolic healthy represent an outer room of the second one. And the second question is, do you think that the simple marker, so I know that, uh, how can I say, lipidomic is very promising and maybe it will be the future, but nowadays with our children and teenagers, can we use the proteinuria also in the class or in university just to measure the level and to understand which people are at high risk to develop an important renal damage and which one no, because I think that is important for clinicians to stratify which guys will have a problem and which one no. Also because when I see a lot of obese patients, they speak normally about hypertension, they speak about diabetes, but when I say, oh, but take care about your kidney, kidney, why kidney? Because I'm only obese, I'm not uh, with chronic kidney disease. So what do you think about it uh, and uh, your opinion? Thanks. Yeah, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I, I have to say that I'm not a clinician. So I have experience, for instance, with, uh, with, uh, with mice and, and, and well, I'm starting to collaborate with clinician. And I'm, I think that the, uh, there's a, that a controversy between this uh, metabolic uh, healthy obese and and the metabolic abnormal uh, obese. Uh, both patients should be treated like a different because actually there is a difference in their adipose tissue. I come back again to the functionality of their adipose tissue. One adipose tissue is fine. In the metabolic healthy, the adipose tissue is fine. And the other has already started to be uh, dysfunctional. So is that why present the, uh, the different metabolic complications? But that it means that the first one, the metabolic uh, normal, is not going to be or to start to be um, um, dysfunctional at some point? Of course, we have seen that, at least in the animal models. Then animal models, they start to be normal because they adipose tissue can expand, but at some point they have limitation. So it's a, the paradox of the lipodystrophy, lipodystrophy, uh, lipodystrophy and the obesity is, is, is their opposite state, but they have the same mechanism that is the dysfunction of the adipose tissue. In one, there's no fat, in the other, there's a limit in the dysfunction. So I think that these patients should be at the beginning treated with like difference because they have difference in their adipose tissue. But at the end, the first one, the metabolic healthy, is going to start to develop all the complications. So at the end, it's better to anticipate and that to prevent. That is your second question. We have to anticipate to diagnose just before they develop these complications and not to have uh, um, signatures of already the damage in the kidney. No wait. We shouldn't wait until the end of uh, when there is a damage in the, in the kidney or in the liver. We should prevent this. With a biomarker, it would be excellent to have kind of biomarker because proteinuria, albuminuria, is starting just to have the damage. So this is just too late. I think that in, in my opinion, I'm not a clinician, but I think that that we should previously uh, to this damage of the kidney where you have all these complications to, to be able to demonstrate that they are gonna have a, a problem. It could be something with images, 
uh, now the technology of imaging, imaging is, is promising. So that could be a, a, a good, uh, a good, um, a, a good uh, position to to have this um, this this anticipation anticipation to the diagnosis of of the all the metabolic uh, comorbidities. Thanks a lot. Clearly, thanks. Okay, thank you, Herman Francisco. Uh, I have uh, some questions for the audience. For example, what's in the uh, same way is, uh, for example, if uh, you are um, uh, you resolve the obesity, is uh, the renal disease uh, resists too? Uh, is possible or is too late? Uh, Gemma or Maru Francesco, what do you think is uh, with the patient uh, develop a chronic kidney disease or proteinuria? Is possible uh, to? come back to, to normal uh, situation or it's too late? I don't know, maybe Maru, because well, they are more used to, to, to study the patients. Uh, I, can, I can tell you about the, the, what, uh, what is our experience in, in the animal models. Maybe you can start and then I will, I will point out. Um. Well, the answer is yes, of course, um, uh, not in all the cases, but um, if we treat uh, obesity uh, at the beginning of the, um, I mean, when, when the patient does not has uh, over clinical uh, renal manifestations as albuminuria, proteinuria, or, or um, chronic kidney disease, uh, when the patient has uh, glomerular hyperfiltration, uh, is, uh, it is demonstrated that uh, after tr the treatment of uh, obesity, uh, especially when the treatment is through um, uh, bariatric surgery, these uh, renal alter alterations um, can uh, recover. Uh, but it is possible uh, if you uh, do this treatment in the early stages of uh, obesity, really glomerulopathy, because when the um, kidney disease is uh, established, uh, maybe it's too late, but the um, studies have demonstrated that uh, even in those cases when the patient has uh, developed uh, chronic kidney disease, uh, after bariatric surgery, when the patient loses uh, a lot of weight and, and, and the um, inflammatory parameters uh, also uh, improve, and and, um, and the lipid uh, also lipid metabolism also uh, improves, then they can um, improve as well um, their kidney disease and 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 manage uh, the uh, chronic kidney disease as, as a stable disease. Uh, you know you, you can um, stop the progression. And the other thing that um, we have seen when, when, when patients with obesity um, treat their obesity uh, with, uh, with diet or, or with uh, bariatric surgery, um, they can uh, improve their um, hypertension, they improve their uh, metabolic state, I mean, um, they improve their diabetes, they type 2 diabetes. So, all these things um, can um, help to um, reverse uh, the, uh, the kidney disease associated with the uh, obesity. Francesco, do you have any comments? I, I totally agree with Manu with uh, uh, an appendix. So it's important to understand how the chronic kidney disease is established for the clinician. So we know that a lot of patients perform maybe estimated GFR, which in obese uh, is not correct for a lot of patients. So when the, the question is when a CKD is already established, so with a real measure GFR less than 60, with a real level of proteinuria, I think that is difficult to uh, come back, but it, it may be easy to stop the progression as Maro has already um, described, because uh, with loss of, of uh, weight, uh, the patient have uh, a well controlled blood hypertension, the level of proteinuria reduces, uh, and so all is fine. But if uh, the uh, 
we are speaking about the initial stages uh, of uh, renal damage, yes, we can, it's a reversible instead of nephropathy, ne diabetic nephropathy, the obesity rate glomerulopathy is something reversible that we should stop, especially at the beginning of the process. So uh, yes, my answer is yes. Thank you. Um, John, Gemma, I think you said that the, the other question, uh, because the, the time is finished. Um, okay, uh, I think it's, uh, at the moment we have the, the best biomarker for clinical biomarker is albuminuria proteinuria, but uh, we think that it's too late. Do you think in the future uh, we will have a new biomarker or a new uh, aspect of uh, our patients with diabetes, uh, with uh, obesity, overweight, that is possible to diagnosis the renal damage before uh, to uh, proteinuria? What is your opinion? I think that um, that um, uh, is is difficult. It's difficult, but I think that that we should try at least uh, with these new technologies that uh, they give us uh, the opportunity to, to measure a big, big, uh, big amount of uh, metabolites, big amounts of uh, lipids, uh, not only in the serum, all, uh, all way, uh, uh, as well in the, in the urine. So this, um, this is, uh, this is uh, an opportunity that before the clinicians they didn't have these uh, technologies of lipidomics, metabolomics, proteomics, proteomics as well. So uh, that could give us too much information about metabolites, specific metabolites, that if we just find out or just follow the pathways, we could at, at least, uh, well, I, 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 I think that, that this, this could be my, my ethic in the, in the research in this, in this field that to find out if there are a lipid, a specific lipid that uh, is going to, to say that uh, the renal damage in this obese patient is gonna uh, start to develop and not in another obese patient. So I guess that, I guess that we have the possibility with these technologies that uh, could help us to find out a specific metabolites, uh, not only in serum, but in, uh, as well in urine because we have the, uh, the benefit that uh, this, the renal disease is also as well, uh, we have the option to have another sample that is the, the urine. So that would be very important to, to find out if there are like specific metabolites in the urine uh, showing us that there is a defect in, the, in these patients. Thank you very much. Uh, probably in the future, we need uh, to, to have a score to uh, clinical, uh, biochemical, metabolic uh, imaging, um, it's possible to, to know what uh, kind of patient develop chronic kidney disease, and this is the, the future. Uh, we need to continue to investigate uh, the different mechanisms uh, linking obesity and uh, kidney. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, audience. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gemma, for your nice presentation, Maru and Francesco, for your opinion, for your comments. I think it's, uh, uh, it's possible to, to continue to talk uh, one, uh, well, uh, one hour more, but uh, we need to, to finish. Uh, I would like uh, to, to thank uh, Valentina and Giuseppe Paladino for their support for this uh, seminar. And uh, finally, don't forget the NES Working Group is seminar titled Revisiting Cholesterol Lowering in CKD and the Addicts, What Have the New Agents Go to Offer? It's scheduled on Tuesday, uh, 22, and is uh, organized by Eureka Working Group. Thank you very much and Hello. have you a good day. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you.